Welcome, everyone. And thank you for being here for this splendid um, dissertation defense by Marianne Casanova, a candidate for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Philosophy and Religion with a concentration in Ecology, Spirituality, and Religion. Uh, this is a wonderful moment, um, really one of the high points of um, the whole academic enterprise to see someone conduct in-depth thorough research and then to reach this moment where they're ready to present and share it with the larger community of scholars. I'm Elizabeth Allison. I am the chair of the Ecology, Spirituality and Religion program at CIIS, California Institute of Integral Studies. I'm uh, joined here today um, by Charlie Forbes, who's the program coordinator for ecology, spirituality, and religion, and who has been um, communicating with many of you all to let you know about this splendid event. And then also the other two committee members on Marianne Casanova's dissertation committee are here. Jacob Sherman is my colleague at CIIS. He's the chair of philosophy and religion and also the chair of philosophy, cosmology and consciousness, and also a core faculty member in ecology, spirituality and religion. And our, um, we are very fortunate to be joined by Marianne's uh, external committee member today, uh, Ilya Delio, who is a Franciscan sister and holds the Connolly Endowed Chair in Theology at Villanova University. Um, she has done what Marianne is uh, endeavoring to do twice. She holds two doctorates, uh, which is extremely impressive, one in pharmacology and one in theology. Okay, how do I do it? And we're very grateful that um, Dr. Delio is able to serve on this committee. She's a, um, an expert in the work of uh, Thierry Deschardins, which you'll hear is very important to Marianne's dissertation. And as we get started here, I'm about to turn this over to Marianne, but I do want to um, give you a few um, tips on the structure of our event today. Um, Marianne will make a presentation of around 30 minutes telling us about the research that she has conducted over the last several years. Um, then we'll take a 30 minute break for Marianne and the committee uh, but during that break, uh, attendees um, in the audience are invited to participate in small group discussions. And Charlie will be able to um, move you into breakout rooms if you'd like to participate in a small group discussion about what you've learned. And we invite you to develop within that small group um, some questions that you would like to pose to Marianne uh, in the public Q&A section. Um, so if you do come up with questions, please chat them to Charlie at the conclusion of your small group discussion. And also please indicate whether you are based in Australia, New Zealand, whether you're based on the East Coast of the United Sorry. States or the West Coast of the United States. And Charlie will be prioritizing questions from the audience uh, according to that um, order that I just laid out with priority to Australia, New Zealand. Um, and then the West Co East Coast, and then the West Coast of US. We, we can repeat these instructions a little later, but I just wanted to let you know there's gonna be a time for small group conversation to generate questions. Um, after a half hour break, we will reconvene and the dissertation committee will ask Marianne questions. Um, and then uh, we will um, remove ourselves to consider um, the defense and the answers to the questions. And during that time, that will be the time for the questions um, from the participants. So those questions that you will have sent to Charlie earlier, um, he will be relaying to Marianne at that time and he will be organizing them and, and then presenting them to her. Um, so I also wanna say that this is a tremendous occasion um, it's, it's a ritual, it's a rite of passage, and it's also a witnessing 
of the work that Marianne Casanova has done over the last several years to reveal um, a lot of connections between two people that you will hear about, Julian Tennyson Woods and Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Um, and so as a public event and a ritual and a witnessing, it's um, an occasion where we can um, honor the work that has gone into this dissertation uh, and celebrate this achievement at this moment. So I'm really grateful that you all have joined to honor and celebrate this work and participate in this public witness. The work you're about to hear about is called When Rocks and Faith Come Together, a Meta Practice of Julian Tennyson Woods and Pierre Teilhard de Chardin by Marianne Casanova. So at this point, I would like to turn the floor over to Marianne. And please make sure to mute your microphone as I'm about to do. And please do not use the chat during this time. Let's give our full concentration to Marianne. Thank you so much. Over to you, Marianne. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, Charlie. Um, I first learned about evolution in my final year at high school during biology. It fascinated me and the theory made sense. However, I had a feeling that this did not sit comfortably with what I had absorbed at Catholic school. I realised that there was a certain dis-ease about the theory of evolution and about modern science. Later, I became intrigued by the Australian Catholic priest scientist, Reverend Tennyson Woods, and later again, the French Jesuit priest scientist, Teilhard de Chardin. At a time when the Catholic Church rejected the findings of modern science, Tennyson Woods and Teilhard were eminent scientists. This dissertation comes from my desire to understand how these men balanced being ordained priest and scientist in an uncomfortable environment. My hypothesis was that Julian Tennyson Woods and Pierre Teilhard de Chardin experienced science and mysticism as one recursive movement or practice. Julian Tennyson Woods, who lived in 1832 to 1889, and Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, who lived between 1881 and 1955, were both Catholic priests and practitioners of modern Western science. Tennyson Woods was a self-educated naturalist and an English migrant to colonial Australia in 1855. Soon after arriving, he was ordained to the Catholic priesthood. As well as his pastoral duties, he set about coming to know and love this new country as a botanist. He acknowledged the Aboriginal people who lived in this country for thousands of years. And I respectfully acknowledge that I am giving this presentation on Ghana country, the country of the Aboriginal people of this area. Contemporary Australian scientists credit Tennyson Woods' work as being a masterpiece of scientific methodology, reasoning and theoretical development. He was known for conducting small scale experiments, for his observational skills, for the accuracy of his field notes and for the accuracy of his hand-drawn studies. He is also known in Australian Catholic history as the co-founder of Congregations of Sisters and for his teaching about the divine he discovered within rocks and flora. Teilhard was from the French aristocracy and had had a privileged education compared to Woods. He was an ordained Jesuit priest and a professional scientist. His geological studies led him into the world of paleontology and anthropology. As a biographer wrote, that as a scientist, he remained faithful to the experimental method. Taylor's ideas of reshaping theology to include scientific findings such as evolution met with opposition from his Jesuit superiors. He continued his international scientific work under this cloud. 
The title of my dissertation emerged slowly. When rocks and faith come together, a metapraxis of Julian Tennyson Woods and Pierre Théard de Chardin. This short title comes from Ilya Delio, who used the phrase, when rocks and faith come together, to describe how Théard's passion for geology and his Catholic faith became one. Rocks and faith signpost what is at the heart of my dissertation. They are symbols for all that makes sense in the universe, the tangible and the intangible. My research is situated within the fields of ecology and religion. It is an integral study which questions the artificial barriers between fields of study and forms of matter. This study is significant because it focuses on two research subjects and it investigates the experiences which help them to meld science and religion together. This dissertation is among the first to bring the experiences of Tennyson Woods and Teilhard into conversation with each other. My study assumes that there is a dynamic relationship already existing between science and mysticism. I assume this relationship as a cyclical washing back and forth between two complementary belief systems, that of modern Western science and Catholic Christianity. Scientific knowledge has a contribution to make to matters of faith, and matters of faith have an equal yet different contribution to make to matters of science. As Teilhard wrote, there is less difference between research and adoration than one might think. In this dissertation, I use mysticism as a category of spirituality because it explores the phenomenon of union with the divine rather than separation from. Both of my men can be described as practicing mysticism. They each engaged in contemplation, that is, communing with the hidden, the intangible, and this brought them into union with love. Both had experiences which fired their hearts and minds and animated their whole beings in God. They found that contemplation shifted them towards greater personal integration or cohesion, something which Teilhard wrote of as a knitting himself together. Tennyson Woods and Teilhard's collection of letters were my primary and secondary sources. And I read them with a question in mind. What do these primary sources record about the scientific and mystical practices of Tennyson Woods and Teilhard de Chardin? Tennyson Woods, of course, wrote in English, so these were accessible to me. I had to rely on English translations of Teilhard's letters, which were originally written in French. I used the translation which current Teilhardian scholars reference. I immersed myself in the men's extensive paper trial, a trial of letters, journals and newspaper articles, of essays, speeches and books. As well, I was able to see some of their collection of objects and artefacts and to visit places that were significant for them. There's nothing like being there and seeing for yourself. In their letters, Tennyson Woods and Teilhard blended accounts of their travels with information about their scientific work. They candidly shared their questions about spirituality and the other puzzles that were niggling at them. They wrote about their routines and they sketched out their visions for the future. Their letters painted for me a picture of the aspects of each man throughout his life. I use a metapraxis approach for showing how Tennyson Woods and Teilhard bring rocks and faith together without losing the distinctiveness of each. Metapraxis implies the use of different methods to provide answers to complex problems. Processes of metapraxis 
rely on continual reflection and action. Tennyson Woods and Teilhard challenged the belief that faith and science are separate. Teilhard saw them as two conjugated aspects or phases of the same complete act of knowledge. They hold that faith is not complete without acknowledging the divine action in creation over time. And similarly, science is not complete without acknowledging the spiritual dimension. Their scientific knowledge was informed by their Christian mysticism. And their Christian mysticism was informed by their science. Here, they found a mutuality and a recursiveness. They found religious significance in all the expressions of matter. Tennyson Woods connected with the divine love when he gazed at the night sky, as he felt his breath being taken away by a beautiful mountain vista, as he stood on the rim of an erupting volcano. Teilhard connected with divine love as he first held a molar of an ancient elephant, as he carefully studied a family of tiny animals through his microscope, or as he chipped away with his geology hammer. I imagine this connection between science and faith to be like an intertidal zone. Marine scientists call it an intertidal zone. It's the place where dry land and water meet. This zone is in a continual state of fluctuation. There are no fixed or hard boundaries, but there is an abundance of activity, of diversity, of creativity, and a cooperation going on within it. Importantly, the literal zone shows how an ecosystem exists in and through the relationship of extremely different realities. An intertidal zone would be lifeless without the shifting tides. I think that Tennyson Woods and Teilhard experienced a surge of life in the coming together of rocks and faith. I imagine Tennyson Woods and Teilhard sitting patiently, critically and with awe, deciphering Earth's stories, which they saw, as Tennyson Woods said, written in plain characters in the great book of nature. They were precursors of new materialism. For them, rocks were alive with energy, with rock agency. Overall, my, my methods were arts-based. I sought to bring Tennyson Woods and Teilhard into conversation with each other using a technique called bricolage. I could find no evidence that Teilhard, whose life overlapped Tennyson Woods by eight years, was familiar with Tennyson Woods' work. In a work of bricolage, I used Tennyson Woods and Teilhard's words and practices in a large mandola. You might be able to see it on the wall, whoops, wrong hand, on the wall behind me. It appears in a slideshow a little later. Did, did we lose Marianne? Is that? I think I'm back. Can you hear me? Okay. I can. Over time, I discovered my reading, reflecting, and creating that common themes and patterns emerged. 
Jonathan Wood's and Teilhard's experiences were in conversation with one another. I sense that Tennyson Woods and Teilhard would have understood my metapraxis approach. Teilhard described his praxis as wanting to work slowly, quietly, living it, and meditating on it like a prayer. As a bricklayer, I became a resourceful borrower and artist. I dipped in and out of disciplines and cross genres. I used the media of collage, watercolour and tapestry in my visual arts research projects. I made four visual works of bricolage during the research, while the two data sets are examples of literary bricolage. There is a helpful overlap between metapraxis and arts-based research. I found that both caught me up in creative thinking and action. Arts-based research method opened me up to different forms of thinking and feeling. I may not have accessed these riches through reading alone. And I felt an affinity with Tennyson Woods and Teilhard while working on the arts-based research projects. Allow me to share an example with you. I looked at watercolour studies by Tennyson Woods and decided to try and replicate his experience. I collected a small shell of the same genus as Tennyson Woods had described and identified while back in Tasmania in 1878. My shell came from the intertidal zone in San Francisco. I followed Tennyson Woods' practice as outlined in his writings of looking and looking again. I used a hand lens to look and look again at the shell's distinctive features. I worked slowly, quietly, living it and meditating on the shell like a prayer. By focusing on the process rather than my presentation, I discovered that the shell ceased to be a generic specimen. It was this particular shell, this particular dog wrinkle. It was a subject. In Tennyson Wood's words, the shell had lost its sameness and tameness. The shell had exchanged details about its physical characteristics as I paid it courtesy of noticing them. It had given me the opportunity to engage with it in a, content, in a contemplative and mystical way. Later, I recognised this exchange as an example of a participatory approach. By recognising the tiny shell's capacity to relate with me and to convey meaning, I experienced its agency. These visual arts projects helped to bring me, as a researcher, closer to the experiences of Tennyson Woods and Teilhard. They revealed important aspects about my research subjects and about me. They helped me to apply the theoretical and interpretive lens in concrete ways. Through my working slowly, quietly, living in and meditating on the data like a prayer, I came to see Tennyson Woods and Teilhard's metapraxis as a three-part recursive movement. There was a cyclical movement of emergence, of being and doing, and of transformation. This study showed that metapraxis applies to other cycles which move between new creation, senescence and death. It suggested that all matter share a common pattern. Tennyson Woods and Teilhard noticed metapraxis long before I had. They used different terms to describe metapraxis. Their Catholic belief referred to this as the Paschal Mystery, the cycle of Christ's suffering, death and resurrection. Their religious and spiritual practices had revealed the presence of that same motive in their lives. Through their geological and biological knowledge, they were familiar with cycles of change. 
and they could read deep patterns in the, in the fossil record and rock strata. Teilhard made links between the evolutionary processes occurring on Earth. He saw metapraxis occurring throughout the entire universe. The recognition of the intellect as having significant spiritual value emerged as a key learning. Both Tennyson Woods and Teilhard applied their intellectual capacities to their spirituality. Teilhard uses the phrase, faith of the intelligence. His desire for a religion which captured both his heart and his intellect is for me a source of inspiration and energy. Perhaps the spiritual value of the intellect will be an area for my future research. I have encapsulated the main conclusions of my research, that is, that science and faith are not separate, in a watercolour of a bare claw clam. The two sides of the clam shell are not identical. The shell markings are asymmetrical. The number and nature of the folds on each side differ, yet they fit together purposefully. They are complementary. Through my holding, studying and painting this shell, I came to appreciate the wholeness and balance which existed because of the union of the two parts. In response to a persistent irritant within it, the bear claw clam may produce a pearl. I saw this as an image of Tennyson Woods and Teilhard's metapraxis. Over time, they transformed adversity, dissonance, and incongruity into a pearl. They gave a better outcome to their daily rubs and major disappointments. The primary sources show that these priest scientists brought together their intellectual and mystical insights into what I interpret as pearls of great price. Tennyson Woods and Teilhard's experience of science and mysticism existed side by side. Their practices moved back and forth between the two sides as both revealed the same loving divine presence, neither side overwhelming the other. My initial claim that Julian Tennyson Woods and Pierre Teilhard de Chardin experienced science and mysticism as one recursive movement or practice has been supported. My research found that Tennyson Woods and Teilhard are examples of living in ways which bring science and spirituality into communion. That Tennyson Woods and Teilhard found divine love revealed in the natural world through contemplation and through scientific method has significant implications for our times. I'll refer briefly to two significant legacies and their implications. Rooted in their recognition of the spiritual value and nature of rocks and matter, both Tennyson Woods and Teilhard modelled personal and cognitive ways of being immersed in the natural world. Everything is as Tennyson Woods exclaimed, new and interesting, full of delight. Everything revealed divine love. But Tennyson Woods' engagement with the natural world catapulted him beyond himself. By looking and looking again, he traversed a bridge from captivation and bewilderment, to use his term, to adoration on the other side. Teilhard's response to rocks was to plunge beyond the observable exteriors, right into the very heart of matter. The world and matter were his undivided milieu. Teilhard wrote, a third road is opening up to make our way to heaven through earth. He re-evaluated and retrieved earth from being an obstacle to human sanctification to being a ready source of sanctification. 
The spiritual practices cultivated by the protagonists brought them to a conscious immersion in the world and the universe. They advocated for attending to rather than removing or closing out the broader sensory scape. I use the Taoyuan term cosmic sense to describe some of their mystical practices. Cosmic sense honors the sacredness of the cosmos, the geosphere and of the biosphere. In our time, we are faced with the complex problem of climate change. Tennyson Woods and Teilhard offer a legacy of looking and looking again at the world, of using both science and faith to bring about a better outcome. They actively sought and acknowledged the divine presence in all matter. I wonder what transformation would be possible if we too cultivated cosmic sense. I wonder how many artificial barriers and old walls might crumble. I wonder what the higher new creation might be. I wonder what transformation would occur if we too actively sought and acknowledged the divine nature of matter. As Roman Catholic priests, Tennyson Woods and Teilhard have left a legacy of great significance in the field of religion. From their place on the margins, they were unable to minister as parish priests. In the absence of a church, an altar, bread and wine, Teilhard raised his understanding of Eucharist to a planetary and cosmic level. He revised the Christian imperative to love God and love neighbour by including love of rocks and faith in the universe. He called for a recasting of theology to reflect evolutionary processes. These, of course, were radical ideas at the time, and they tapped into a polarisation between modern science and the Catholic Church in the 19th and 20th centuries. At this time, the institutional church held that the theory of evolution as taught by modern science was wrong. They argued that it rejected the divine as creator, as outlined in the biblical sources. In our time, however, many aspects of Teilhard's vision for a new religion can be found in the teachings of the Catholic Church. For example, Pope Francis's 2015 encyclical Laudate Si cites Teilhard in the official teaching and care of our common home. The Sisters of St. Joseph of the Sacred Heart, the religious congregation of which I am a vowed member, have included Teardian language and cosmology in the statements of our two most recent general chapters, that one of 2013 and more recently 2019. These aspirational documents call us as Sisters of St. Joseph to live into mystery to be drawn into a new communion through movements of allurement, relationship and emergence, to be immersed in the evolving mysteries of the universe of earth and of humanity. We are to reimagine the gospel and we are called to be women of earth and to minister with Christ in the cosmos. This leaves one question unanswered. When am I going to be finished? The honest answer is that I never will be finished. I will continue to work slowly, quietly, continue to live it, continue meditating on it like a prayer. How can I expect to be finished? Tennyson Wood didn't, Tao didn't, the universe hasn't, and neither have the processes of metapraxis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marianne, for that eloquent and beautiful presentation. Um, these, the, your final words just uh, really, really stick with me as far as when are you going to be finished? When are we going to be finished? The universe is not, Teilhard is not, Tennyson Woods is not, 
to me, that is one of the most powerful statements of hope I've heard in a really long time. And of course, we know the world needs statements of hope right now. So I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. So um, in, in respect of um, Miriam's uh, great effort, um, which is very clear, we are going to allow her and the committee um, a half hour break and during which time we will go um, off of our video. And then Charlie will be inviting um, the audience to join small groups for about 15 minutes of conversation about what you learned and questions that you might like to pose to Marianne during the Q&A period. Um, after you have those questions prepared, please chat them to Charlie. And also please indicate um, the uh, geographical location of the questioner because as uh, Marianne resides in Australia, um, we would like to prioritize questions from Australia and New Zealand, first of all, and um, then uh, to respect and honor um, Elia Delio from the East Coast, we would like to hear from some East Coast people, and then ultimately we will hear from some West Coast people. So please um, indicate your geographical location along with your question that you send to Charlie. Um, so, and then, so let's see, it's 3.35 right now. So we'll, we will resume at uh, 4.05 in half an hour, the, the committee and Marianne. Um, and, um, but we invite the participants to take um, 15 minutes in small groups to discuss what you've learned. Does that sound good? Charlie, are you able to then send people into small groups? I can certainly do that, yeah. Okay, so we will see everyone here at 4.05 again. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for returning from the break and returning from the breakout rooms promptly. I, I see so many faces, so I think, and we I see that Marianne has come back. So I think I will go ahead and um, introduce the, uh, the structure for the, the next part of our event, which is the uh, questions from the dissertation committee members. And I will invite, um, each committee member in turn to ask a question. So we'll go around um, once with, with one question from each member. And then uh, I will invite a second round of questions if questions remain. And then I will ask if there are any questions after that still mm -hmm. remaining uh, and we will ask those. And I want to um, remind the candidate Marianne, that she can ask for clarification. Um, she can ask committee members to repeat a question if it's not clear. And then I want to remind the committee members that um, if we have a multi-part question, we should specify that. And then we should clearly state, this is, this is a two-part question. Here's the first part. Here's the second part, just in case you have a question like that. And then when you're satisfied with the answer, please let Marianne know and, and you can say like, okay, we're ready to move on to the next question or thank you that I'm satisfied and then we can move on. Um, so, and I think we'll take around half an hour depending on how many questions. If we have more questions, we may go a little bit past that. Um, so I would like to invite um, Ilya Delio if you have a question to begin. We will need you to come off mute, please. I guess that would help. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. I want to give a, a big thanks to Marianne for bringing us to this evening and for a very, very interesting work, which I have enjoyed reading. Um, my first question, actually, you use the terms orthopraxis and metapraxis. Uh, and I would like you, uh, my, my question is in two parts. One. Um, how do these two terms, these two praxes, relate to one another? 
uh, if metapraxis is this opening up of a third way, what is the role of orthopraxis? Okay. Um, an immediate thought is that orthopraxis is really the translation, as I understand it, of beliefs into action. Whereas metapraxis is uh, a much more underlying, ongoing, uh, general movement. Um, I described metapraxis as the coming together of two uh, potentially opposites or different, very different um, uh, realities. Uh, and that making something that is, as you say, the third road. Um, I guess in a way, orthopraxy also leads to a third road because it, or at least a second road, because it, it moves uh, beliefs and theory into reality. Okay, yeah, I, um, I do think, yeah, I think they are related to one another. I think your answer is certainly on the right track for this. Maybe in, in light of that, um, one of the things I, th I think here, I mean, you've emphasized throughout your dissertation, you know, science and mysticism, this meta praxis of bringing these two things together into a, into a third way. What is the role of consciousness? I mean, it seems so fundamental here, but I didn't see too much um, <clears throat> exploration of the role of consciousness here. Uh, you do mention it throughout, but it, it, it doesn't have a... Uh, a, a, a significant focus. Can you just speak a little bit, like where do you see the role of consciousness within this whole stream of this new, this new pathway between science and mysticism? Um, I like the way that, that Teilhard relates to consciousness as uh, something that is evolving and something that is uh, complexifying, um, and I see that as part of the outcome of metapraxis, that with each advancement, each, each move, each incremental change, each um, new coming together, so to speak, um, results in a, in a change of consciousness um, that presumably is at a, uh, a more advanced, higher uh, more um, integral level than it would otherwise be. Okay, I'm just maybe pressing that a little bit more. Um, consciousness is, uh, um, in a sense, it is the interiority, the interiorization of um, moving to those higher levels of awareness. It's a, it's a, is, is consciousness for you a material process or not? Uh, it's associated with material processes because we see a change in uh, expressions of consciousness as we see the development of, uh, for example, we take biotic life. We see different expressions of consciousness um, with different uh, forms of biotic life. So, yes, it does have a material expression, but um, it also has, as you say, that interior component as well. Yeah. Which, of course, fits with the whole argument that I'm making, that it is the two together that are, are complementary and, um, and something greater, a higher abstraction, than if you simply took the physical or simply took the, the um, internal. But to take the two together um, adds that richness, which we see. That's why the literal zone is such a, an amazing metaphor to bring the two opposites together in that dynamic, creative, explosive sort of um, uh, middle ground or meeting point. Yes. yes. Yeah, I did appreciate that. Um you know, your ex exposition of the literal zone and both in, in the text and your visualization of that as well. So that was very good. Um, I also have, I, I don't know, um, Elizabeth, 
how many how long do you want me to that um, if if that's kind of concluded one area of interest that's good you have, yes. then i would probably move on to jake and we'll come back to you so, okay thank yeah. you okay great thank you very much sure. um so yes i'd like to invite jake sherman to ask a question Hi, Marianne. Uh, first, uh, congratulations on the presentation and the dissertation uh, and getting to this point. It's been a, a great work and I've learned a tremendous amount along the way, especially about Tennyson Woods, about whom I knew almost nothing before this. Um, mm -hmm. And so I really, really, really valued that. And I also was very grateful for the opportunity to think through aspects of Teilhard de Chardin again, which uh, I started my graduate studies doing 20 some years ago and uh, have always enjoyed the chance to do so again. The, I think the question I wanna pose um, to begin with, I'm gonna center it on Tayar, but it relates to your entire dissertation uh, or to your project. Uh, so, and I see your, I see your project and your conclusions as really, you know, being about this, this um, generative integral relationship between faith and science, between mysticism and um, the intellectual uh, and sensual understanding of the material world and so forth. So there's a point in your dissertation toward the end when you, you write, Teilhard uses fusion to describe the coming together of his love of God and the world. Through this fusion, he was transformed into an expression of what he termed the ultra human. And then you go on to quote Teilhard. Um, the, the broader context of the quote is, is Teilhard writes, everywhere on earth at this moment in the new spiritual atmosphere created by the appearance of the idea of evolution, there float in a state of extreme mutual sensitivity, love of God and faith in the world, the two essential components of the ultra human. These two components are everywhere in the air. Generally, however, they are not strong enough, both at the same time, to combine with one another in one and the same subject. In me, it happens by pure chance, temperament, upbringing, background, that the proportion of the one to the other is correct and the fusion to the two has been affected spontaneously. So I wanted to read that just for everyone who's listening because they won't have read it in the whole dissertation. You're obviously very familiar with it. Um, so I find Teilhard's description here both compelling and somewhat troubling. Teilhard seems to say that the precise measures necessary for the kind of side-by-side -side partnering of science and faith that you're commending, uh, it, he seems to say, and, and also that he identifies with the emergence of the ultra-human, which maybe I'll get to in a second question, uh, he seems to be saying that that ha just happens to occur in him, right? By chance, it's there. And we can think of others like this, right? So like, Tennyson Woods is a great example, Brian Swim, maybe Sister Elia, uh, and so on. Examples of people in whom this, 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 these two sort of great forces in our contemporary cultural moment find a balance necessary for them to integrate. Uh, and I think your study shows that that occurred in Tennyson Woods and Teilhard de Chardin. And so that it's possible for these two things to exist side by side. But my question is, is how do we address the felt disjunction of science and faith that seems to pervade so much of our culture when we don't just happen to be born with those two things coinciding in us, right? In Teilhard, there's a perfect mixture for it. Uh, in Tennyson Woods, there seemed to be a perfect mixture for it. But in so many of our contemporaries, there seems to be just an absolute disjunction where that mixture, what one or another polarity is way overbalanced. Um, so how does, does your study of them provide some sense for how we go about addressing that disjunction when it's felt as opposed to when it's already integrated because of happenstance, life history, culture, or you know the balance of the humors inside our body or something like that. Does that make sense? No. <laughs> no, but um, the, what, I, what I'll say is that, um, yes, you've identified a number of people, some of whom are among us today, others who are um, no longer present, but their works live on, their example lives on. 
I think what you're talking about may have something to do with that role of being a prophet and a precursor of being um, sensitive to the circumstances of the world, whether that's the world of knowledge, the, the spiritual world, the actual physical world, and being sensitive to, um, to alternatives. Like um, we talk about uh, being a precursor of being among the first to sort of hint at things coming in another way. Um, uh, if we look at like Walter Brueggemann, he talks about there's no point being a prophet unless you can in fact offer some form, some suggestion of remediation, some other way forward. So we don't need to have a lot of those people. And we do know from uh, just the little list that you gave that while these people are exceptional and unique, they're not um, an endangered species. They are among us um, and, um, and make a difference. Um, that disjunction, um, the work that I, I read around the, the idea of um, bringing uh, polar opposites together, talks about the fact that that can only work if both sides are of equal value uh, and one doesn't overwhelm and, and subsume the other. So um, we think about that in terms of the simple exercise of breathing in and breathing out. Like if there's a disjunct between my ability to breathe in that compromises my entire system. My ability to breathe out is also compromised. Whereas if both are working well, then it's a fine and a healthier circumstance. That's the same with the uh, coming together of uh, the potentially opposites, often seen as opposites, but my argument is that they aren't opposites. They are in fact parts of the one um, reality, um, then it, it's a, a different outcome. It's a different view. I don't know if that goes anywhere near answering your question, Jacob. No, that does. Uh, I mean, I, I, hear, I hear sort of two, two parts in your answer. On the one hand, I hear you saying that there are these exemplars uh, and, you know, as someone attracted to virtue theory and, and things like that in, in philosophy, I, I think that's that's a great, that's, that is a powerful thing. We could look at someone like Teilhard or uh, uh, Sister Elia or Brian as exemplars who act as a kind of moral or intellectual lure for for this integration of, of science and mysticism. Uh, and then on the other hand, I hear you talking about the need to hold hold these respective discourses in uh, a kind of, um, to, to not let one dominate the other. And, and so I guess my, my follow-up question on that would be, how, how does that work exactly? Is that when you say, when you give the example of breathing in and breathing out, um, there's, and, and neither one uh, sort of mixing with the other, that that could lead one to think that it's almost like a sort of Stephen Jay Gould non-overlapping magisteria vision of the relationship of science and faith. Uh, and I wonder if that's is that is that correct, or can the is there a kind of circular breathing possible where one's both inhaling and exhaling at the same time, and maybe it lets you play a didgeridoo that you couldn't otherwise. Um, do you see what do you see what I'm saying? Uh, is there is there a sense that the mystical might make a difference in what can be discovered through the scientific, or alternatively, that the scientific might make a difference in what can be understood about the divine? That's at the heart of heart of my argument, and it's also at the heart of the um, the mandala metaphor where the two opposites, usually circular, are brought together. And that overlapping area in common is the area that raises both 
um, mm. both sides into that new um, emergent creation. Um, and as for didgeridoo playing, Charlie is uh, an exponent of that. So uh, <laughs> there we go. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to Elizabeth for now. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, thank you both for um, these really provocative questions to begin our discussion. Um, and thank you very much, Marianne, for uh, a wonderful presentation um, through which I have uh, and, and work through which I have um, learned a ton and really enjoyed thinking alongside you about the relationship between mysticism and, and science. Um, and in particular, I'm really interested in how uh, your two protagonists, Teir de Chagan and uh, Julian Tennyson Woods, how they engage with a natural world, which you focus on a lot, um, especially in chapter four, which is titled Learnings from Rocks. Um, and in that chapter, you discuss how uh, these priest geologists um, practice their vocation and their uh, fascination with rocks um, and the numerous different ways that she, they learn from rocks. Um, and I, I really commend it to everyone in the audience because it's really fascinating to um, hear how these two learn from rocks. But I was wondering how learning from rocks might be similar or different from learning about rocks. And I, I think you're suggesting it's different. So I wonder if you could say more about why it's learning from rocks, not learning about rocks. Um, and secondly, I'm wondering if you can characterize overall um, the ways in which these two exemplars learned from rocks like are there um was there certain qualities to their practice or their engagement or were there certain types of things are there any sort of overarching themes that um you can share with us about their learning from rocks yes there is and this is a question that that really um excites me and really connects with my uh, life more broadly. Um, that is a really important distinction to make between learning about and learning from. And um, uh, that little uh, shell that I, I held up before and um, the shell that's over my shoulder is my, my representation of that. I believe that I learned about that shell. I learned about its physical characteristics. I learned about the, uh, the, the markings of it, the, the changes of color, the, the move of um, the smooth pearlescence of the inside to the, to the uh, outside. I learned the physical bits of that shell. Uh, but I also learned something else about that shell. I learned from that shell. I learned that, um, that that shell has something to offer. That shell has an agency, a shell agency of its own. And it is something of value in its own right. And of course, that is what the um, what Tennyson Woods and Taylor experienced. And I believe that. Um, that beautiful little set of, um, of phrases of Teilhard's of actually living it and taking it slowly, spending time with and meditating on the other is a way of learning uh, from. Um, that whole contemplative element, that whole um, connecting spirit to spirit um, we know that Teilhard is really uh, strong on the existence of energy within every um, physical expression of matter and that learning uh, 
learning with rocks, learning from rocks, is really a connection of those the, the spirit, um, that energy within me and the energy within the other, whether that's a, a vast landscape or something of a microscopic value. It's the, the contemplative, the mystical component that, um, that I believe makes the difference. Thank you. Um, and to, to follow up on that, I think that was a very clear distinction between the learning about and learning from. Um, and to follow up on that, can you characterize um, broadly anything that the two learned from rocks? Um. One of my favorite favorite quotes from Tennyson Woods refers to uh, the disappearance or lack of sameness and tameness. Um, he says that when you really commune with something, it begins to be an individual. It's um, it's particular characteristics, virtues, its attributes become obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, you can pick up a hundred shells on the beach or go over to your um, collection of minerals and open the drawer and there's like however many of the same uh, quartz or whatever. But each is a different expression. And appreciating that, seeing that, uh, honouring that is, um, is a big part of, of the, the approach. Um, yeah, um, there's probably more that could be said on that. Yeah. Maybe to just prompt you just a little bit more then, since you said there's probably more. Um, do you see those learnings influencing the spirituality of the two protagonists? Yes, I do. I do, um, and that's that's again that that's central to my entire dissertation, um, and I think that's part of a, a characteristic that um, is not to consider that what I've experienced over here in my contemplative looking at the quartz specimen at the rock at the tiny family of animals under the microscope of the night sky is it's not separate from the information that I know about um, all of the, the taxonomy or the, the chemistry or the, the, um, the physiology that's gone into uh, producing the particular thing, the particular thing. It's not a specimen. It's a, uh, it's, it's a subject, it's something to behold and converse with. Thank so you there's a certain much. openness and, um, and an a ability to cross over back and forth that, um, that I think is key. Thank you, great. So I would like to um, hand the questioning back to Sister Ilya. If you have further questions, yes, I do. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, uh, Marianne, um, you know, your work really comes at, at a crucial time on our planet as we're emerging out of, I think, or beyond axial religions into a new type of uh, complexified religious consciousness for sure. Um, so you're going to receive a lot of questions. And maybe my question is, is um, anticipating uh, some of those. What makes your dissertation work uh, distinct from naturalism? In other words, is this a work of naturalism? And if so, what does faith add to it? Let's take the question of naturalism first. Is this, is this a work of naturalism? Is this a naturalist philosophy, for example? Um, one of the lenses for interpretation that I, I um looked at it was the lens of Christian animism, which is, I guess, in some ways, uh, close to, to the naturalism um, idea. Um, what, makes it, what makes my uh, 
discussion different and what makes Christian animism different is that the Christ is actually figured in the um, in in the whole story. Um, the two men, my two protagonists, saw the divine and experienced the divine in the natural world, in the natural environment. Um, we know that Tennyson Woods was uh, an exponent of natural theology in that he saw the, the workings of nature um, as an expression of, uh, of God, as a, as a teaching point, as an uh, instructive um, theological um, experiment. Um, so, yes, uh, they are quite different, and I would like to keep that focus on the, uh, the element of, of the Christian uh, side of things. And that, of course, moves it into the religious arena, yeah. But, but what if someone does not have any religion and is, you know, and where, where does someone say without any explicit um, confessional faith, where might they fit into this paradigm? Um, does one need to I, be a Christian? <laughs> absolutely not. And um, I think that the Pope's invitation through Laudate Si to to all the um, all the citizens of Earth, regardless of their their faith or their uh, their, their belief systems, um, um, are part of the, the story. There's room for everybody. Um, the particular the particular slice that interests me is the slice that includes. Uh, the Christian element and includes um, the the mix from from science. Yes. Okay. Thanks. So, my follow up question then is: Nature self sufficient? In other words, do we need anything else beyond nature, or is all that we seek and all that we desire within nature itself? Oh my. <laughs> not um, to be a trick question it's it, i'm just trying to understand where you might stand on this position i imagine that may well be the case for some people it's not the case for me um because i my background my my life experiences my um uh tell me that there is something more and that more is the, the, the piece that, um, that really fired both Tennyson Woods and, and Teilhard. And uh, to incorporate whatever that more is, is, um, is the life's work, really. So just one more question as a follow-up. So is the moreness, the transcendent nature of matter? Or in other words, what is the God dimension of matter here? I think that's a, um, I don't think there's one single answer to that. How would you answer that, Elia? <laughs> no, I, I'm the one who's asking you. <laughs> <laughs> nice try, though. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> I don't know. No, I, I, honestly, Marianne, it's it's you're doing great. Um, but these questions are exactly the questions that people ask me all the time. You know, when I'm I'm speaking about these this kind of material, so um, it, it really is important to think, continue to think as you as you have done so well here. You know, about this God question in relation to what we're saying is, I mean, you're saying that nature really has all the dimensions that of human of the human search, right, for meaning, for purpose, uh, and for our deepest longing. Is there anything beyond nature? That's always, what, you know, is there something beyond nature or is nature itself open to? Is it, does itself have this transcendent dimension? And, and so nature itself is not self-sufficient. It, it itself is an open process um, to something, to use your language, the more. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's significant as we begin to try to bring together uh, faith and rocks 
um, you know, what is it we have faith in? If we have faith in the rock, you know, what is it that this rock will pull me toward um, that is more than mere materiality? Uh, so I'm just, I'm really interested because you use God language throughout the dissertation, but sometimes God is um, within nature. Sometimes God is entangled with nature. So it's helpful to know like, what is the God? How, how do we perceive this personal God in relation to the rocks and, and the dirt and the sky and the sun? Um, so more, more that, that's rhetor rhetorical question at this point, but the question of naturalism is a huge one. Um, and it's one that continues to divide in some ways, uh, sort of parse out um theistic evolutionary people from just you know pure naturalists like i why why do i need religion if nature itself has um all that i'm seeking uh why why do i have to believe in a personal god at all that sort of is sort of the challenge here that's underpinning your work mm, i would agree that it's a challenge yes that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a, yeah. I mean, such a, an essential set of questions for all of us who think about religion and ecology. This, this question, well, it's right there, religion and ecology. So we're saying ecology maybe is not enough in some way. And we're thinking about religion in relation. So I'm sure that Jacob has more questions in this vein or in another vein. No, it's totally in this vein. This is um, this that was exactly the sort of line that I was going to follow for my next question. So I, I'll go ahead and see if if we can go further with it. Um, and if not, I still have an, one more topic that I, it would be fun to address if we have time. Um, so that I, the way I was going to come at a version of the question that Sister Elia asked is is this way. You talk, Marianne, about both Tennyson Woods and Teilhard anticipating certain contemporary movements like uh, the new um, the new materialisms, for example, and I think of sort of like posthumanisms, um, different than the transhumanisms. That, but the, the like the sort of the new materialist posthumanist approach to paying attention to the uh, the getting rid of the bifurcation of nature and culture, paying attention to the agency of non-human and non-social actors. So we, you know, new materialists will think about like, what do buildings do? What do metal, al metal alloys do? How do mountain retreats, bridges, glaciers, guns, germs, steel, whatever, how do all these things act in and have agency in the construction of history and our planet? Uh, and and I think you're right. You, you, you really demonstrate throughout your, your thesis that both Teilhard and Tennyson Woods are anticipating aspects of this, but it's not clear to me how they, how say the new materialists would react to the theological dimension that is bound up with Teilhard and Tennyson Woods' account of frisky matter. Right? It's it in their account there's a kind of nicest towards, as Teilhard puts it, towards individuality and towards even the divine, towards the omega point and, and things like that. Uh, or in Tennyson Woods' natural theology, there's a, there's a lure towards God that makes, that, that's part of what makes rocks legible uh, to him. And so, but that seems to me to be in tension with a lot of these movements today. Is that is there a way of mediating that tension? Uh, does your study of Tennyson Woods and Teilhard de Chardin give you resources to enter that discussion and to open it to a wider dimension, or do these two just sort of run on parallel tracks, but without necessarily intersecting? In a way, your question is, is much wider than my research. And I suspect that with my just touching on uh, these two men as being precursors of movements such as um, new materialism or whatever, um, 
they they they're just opening the door or the window that that wee bit. They're not. Um, they haven't jumped through completely, um, and yet they're starting. I can see. I sense when I read their material um, that there's a disruptive element in what they're they're writing uh, and what they're saying. That that makes one uh, stop and think again. Um, at the end, I closed uh, the the data set on Tayard with that question that he included in a letter to his friend. And the question simply is, I wonder what the hippos will say about that. <laughs> and when I first found that, I thought, oh, this is, this is nice. This is a funny little quirky um, thing. It kind of like tips, tips my attention into a different direction. And the more that I, I've sat with it and thought about it and, and, um, and worked slowly with it and imagined it, the more I see that it has a lot more happening behind it because he's saying that the hippo has an opinion and I need to know what, that, what the hippo's opinion is. The hippo has something to offer me um, and I cannot disregard that. If the hippo has something to say, who else, what else does? And how am I going to attend to that? If I am busy saying that that's a hippo and it can just play in the water and um, do its thing, well and good. But if I want to know what is actually going on for that hippo, that is a completely different um, kind of approach. And I think that's what they do. They open the window that little bit to say, oh, there's things out there. What can I learn from them? What can they learn from me? And I want to spend time in their company. Is there, echoing sort of Sister Elia's point, is there a sense in which what I can, is there a sense in which what I can learn from them and what they can learn from me is changed by, by their approach and your approach having a theological opening, even a theological culmination, I think, in Tennyson Woods' vision. Uh, with Teilhard's too, I guess. Uh, is that, or or is that just a, or is the theological aspect, the 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 God aspect, is it something that that you can take it or leave it without changing the account of the agency of non-human uh, actors? Uh, I'm sure for some it, it it is an optional additive, but in in a more integral holistic uh, approach, then I believe it needs to be there. Mm. And of course, I'm not alone in that. There are there's a lot of work being done around that. What it means to really have that full integral expression to really have that that broadest um, embrace. Yeah, like you, you yeah. said, you have yeah. effect uh, in a number of places. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, let me hand it over to Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, I think perhaps building on these questions, but maybe taking them in a different direction. Um, you are completing a degree in, with a concentration in ecology, spirituality, and religion um, in a program focused on the emerging field of religion and ecology. So based on your research and based on your deep intimacy with these two protagonists who are, um, as you've said, precursors and, and opened this field and, and opened so many things for so many others, to walk through or to carry forward. How do you see your work uh, influence, 
influencing the field of religion and ecology. If, if the field changes or develops in response or because of your work, what kind of changes will be coming about? Um, that, that's a question that I think points straight to uh, the legacies that um, that I identified and and described in in the um, closing part of my dissertation, and uh, I referred to some of that in in my um, presentation earlier this morning. There's a transformative effect that um, that is possible to. Uh, to really um, introduce uh, new ways of looking at things and new ways of being, ways which involve the, the intellect and the, um, the spiritual, uh, ways that involve uh, much more than, than the siloed approaches that we, we tend to uh, default to at present. So um, there's a, a lot to be done. Um, from my experience over the last 30 years working in the area of ecology within um, various uh, sectors of the, the Catholic Church and within my own congregation, I can see that there has been a lot of um, transformation and growth that has occurred. And, um, I want to be a part of that and to keep um, to keep that momentum happening. There's been significant shifts, and um, I think that we have good exemplars to build on and to continue to uh, to work on. And uh, we certainly have plenty of need to do that in the in terms of the the state of our world and the state of our planet. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. Absolutely. So maybe to draw out a few more details on that from you, um, if you were, say, leading a group there in Australia, um, having completed this dissertation and really reflected on the, uh, the approaches of your two protagonists and how that, those approaches allowed them to see differently and to learn differently, what kinds of um, teachings or practices would you be sharing with students of yours? Um, that's a question that really delights me. And, and I do have the opportunity to, uh, to imagine that more fully and more immediately. Um, at the moment, I have a role with the congregation um, as, the, as part of the, the project around the Date C. And we have, like so many other um, groups within the Catholic Church, we have committed ourselves to a seven-year action plan. Mm -hmm. And much of that action plan, our point of difference is really in that contemplative stance, in really looking, um, taking the time to work slowly to live and to meditate on what, um, what is presented to us. So um, a lot of uh, the, the as, a, as a former primary school teacher, um, I'm really uh, quite uh, keen on practical hands-on experiences and um, giving some sort of expression as the as the work on the wall behind me shows um, and to look not only um, at things in a, a, a cognitive way but to look at what action can be done and that action might be small and individual action and choices that build or it might be um, Working on systemic change, both things are important. So, uh, yes, my my work will be continue to be influenced by my study, and um, I look forward to that. Thank you. 
So I, I am mindful of time. Um, I want to find out though, whether the other two committee members have questions that remain unanswered and you are definitely invited to ask those. I'll just ask a very general question. Um, what, what was the most significant thing you learned in your dissertation? The most significant aspect of it for you? That's a great question. And I have thought about that. Um, I, I learned a key learning has really been that the intellect has a significant role to play in spirituality. That um, there's a place for, for using that, um, that, that God-given intelligence, that acquired intelligence, that wonderful level of consciousness that uh, belongs to the human species. Um, I thought more about uh, the, the spiritual value of the intellect. And the other day I was thinking, well, if it goes that way, it must also go the other way as well. There must be an intellectual value to spirituality. And that's something that I would like to um, like to kind of uh, play with a little bit more. Hmm. Thank you. We have further questions, Jake. Um, I I have a ton of further questions, but I don't need to. I don't think I need to pursue them um, uh, this evening. Uh, I, I, it's a very it's a very generative it's a very generative nexus of uh, of both historical figures and um, and uh, substantive engagements that Marianne's addressed in this dissertation. So it raises all sorts of issues. I guess I, I'll take one last final one. This, I, this is um, when you describe them as being prophets, Marianne, and, and you do this both in your conclusion and you did it again today. Um, I could imagine you could also look at them as in some ways, um, I don't hold to this view. <laughs> but you could you could see them as anachronistic in that you know Tennyson Woods natural theology and Teilhard de Chardin's uh, weaving of his faith into into and his scientific studies together that that represented something that was more of a 19th century even 18th century movement that uh, that was frustrated in the 20th century. Uh, what, what is it that is, what do you find so compelling about, about, because I, I think you make a, a strong case that they are lures for us and not, they're, they're ahead of us rather than in our rear view mirror. Uh, what makes, what makes that so compelling to you? Um, I don't see, Tennis of Woods and, and Taylor as being at the same place. They, they, their life was at a different historical period. Our life is at a different historical period. We have other uh, sources of information and other understandings of um, even the subtleties of, of um, the, the images that have come back from from that latest um, telescope in space that suggests, hey, there's stars out there, there are, there's galaxies, there's bodies out there that predate what our theory to date says. Um, we need to keep addressing and changing and, and moving on. Um, what I like about the, the two men as, uh, as exemplars is that they weren't set on a particular set of understandings or interpretations. Like good scientists, they were ready to adjust with, with the newness of thought, 
with the newness of questions, whatever the niggle was that was coming in. Um, and I think that's that's something that offers us uh, an opportunity as well. Uh, I don't see them as being up ahead. In fact, they're, they're behind. We have a lot more to work on than what they had. Um, at the moment, we don't have uh, the same strictures that are put on us by uh, the Jesuit superiors that, such as, you know, Teilhard experienced and the, the clamping down and the ostracization that went on um, when their ideas proved to be too radical for the time. Um, we've moved on to, to a stage where uh, we can voice big ideas we can try things out. We can experiment, and we need to do that. So uh, that's a bit of a mix in my answer. I hope it goes some way towards uh, your your question, Jacob. Yes, thank you. Wonderful, thank you. So I think at, at this point, unless there are any um, remaining outstanding questions from the committee we should, the committee should move to a breakout room to deliberate about uh, what we've heard and what we've read earlier. And then um, I believe Charlie has the questions from the audience that he will then address to Marianne. Um, so we're ready to. Okay, I'll, I'll send you on your way. You should get an invite that comes to your screen here. Great, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, well, Marianne, thank you so much. Um, of course, if I knew I was going to get a didgeridoo shout out, I, I would have, I could have been prepared. <laughs> you could have been prepared. You've been threatening it for six years. <laughs> <laughs> but but thank you so much um, for your thoughtful insights here on um, and your work, the culmination of your work here. Um, so uh, let's let's start with a question here coming out of Adelaide. Um, from the time of Julian to now, people as a whole put more faith in science now than in a divine source and ongoing creator, whereas Julian often pulled back from saying creation can be totally trusted. And there's a quote here, I, I don't know, this might be something you know, but I turn sadly away to think of the one who is eternal. How can we promote the integration of both? So I think the question is speaking to this idea that science and faith need to hold equal positions and neither should really dominate but so can you can you speak to um, either the quote or how we can integrate those two uh, one of the things that I had to get my head around in the reading and um, in my reflection and so forth was to sort of have a sense of that um, the Victorian mindset and the theology and the the piety and the other practices that went on in, um, in, at that time. Um, and I think the, the quote that, that's been uh, given is really one of those, uh, those uh, examples of, of where um, at the, the asceticism, where that sense of, um, of uh, self-discipline and uh, rigidity comes through in um, in the the writing um, but yes the the idea of bringing both sides together and having the two uh, things as being equally weighted is really um, important um, yes and we have uh, there has been a move and that's been well documented and well researched and I know some of the people on um, on screen today are doing their work in this area about um, uh, what we believe in and what we hold to be true and what we uh, can 
accept as not being fixed and so forth. So it's um, it's a, a an interesting area to work in. Um, well, thank thank you, Marianne. Thank you. Um, okay, I am conscious. Uh, or sorry, um, your your artwork is beautiful, um, but. Um, but can you articulate how your experience differs from that of the artist? Th this is how the, the language of that the question came through. I don't know if that pertains um, um, to, to your methods, but so can you speak more to your artistic uh, process as a method used in your research? Um, it's something that, you know, we've been looking at the, the pictures behind you on, on the wall and, um, it's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, please, please talk a little more. Yeah, um, I, I don't consider myself to be an artist. I don't consider myself to be uh, a, a, a competent drawer or painter or whatever. Um, I'm, I have creative urges and uh, the need to put something out there that I can see and reflect on, whether that's in the form of, of uh, written work or perhaps some kind of graphical uh, visual um, display. Um, one of the things that happens while I'm doing some work, for example, uh, you might see there's the suitcase down over on the floor there, which is um, made most of it is a 3,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. And, and the, the point of, of the, the project is not what the end product looks like. That is very um, secondary. What's important is the process. What's important is the doing. And I'll go back to that, that little refrain again of like it, it's a matter of taking it slowly, living it, meditating it meditating on it, um, allowing the different levels and layers of meaning um, to, to surface and bubble away. And, and um, uh, it's an opportunity that takes me out of my more dominant kind of um, uh, brain-powered approach into something that's more creative. Um, and as I said in my... Um, presentation and as the, the people that support arts based research say these things are of more value and uh, sources of learning than just reading books and um, and studying documents alone there's a, another dimension a more holistic integrated dimension that comes from that mm. well um, um I don't believe you when you say you're you're not an artist <laughs> or you don't consider yourself an artist. Um, obviously, spending some time uh, with you over the years, getting to see getting to see your art, and now, of course, just last week was the first time I um, really saw this collection of images that are so beautiful and intricate um, mm. and detailed that I mean, you can just stare at them. Um, for I mean, so. What what was it about uh, the the objects you picked up? Like why a shell? What what is uh, what is this? Um, does it pertain to um, either of the two individuals who were part of your research? Um, shells, yes. Um, Tennyson Woods uh, spent time on the coast of Australia. Uh, he was there in a time when he didn't have diving equipment or a boat or, or sophisticated dredging equipment. So his study of shells was principally related to that which he found along the edges in the literal zone. So I was really excited when I read some of his journal articles describing the shells from the literal zone of Australia. And I was using that, that literal zone as um, as an important metaphor in my research. Um, so that was a really nice uh, meeting point between the two of us. And uh, he talked too about the difference between doing a study of 
uh, a, a, of a, uh, an object, of a subject, of a, of a piece, as opposed to doing a portrait. So uh, behind, if I move my head, there's actually a study of that little shell that I held up before. Oops, I better go, which way I'm going to go? That way. And up above that, I don't know if you can see it as well. You may have seen it during the, um, the slideshow. It's a portrait of a shell to capture the, the characteristics, the essence, the, the kind of um, quirkiness of a shell as distinct from replicating its, um, its exact um, placement of colour and ridge and whatever else. So, yes, um, it was a great way to... Uh, get close to uh, to my protagonists who both did illustrations of their scientific work. Um, yeah, and for Tennyson and Woods, shells were easy to collect, at least whereas the ones that were on, um, you know, available at low tide. Well, thank you for bringing that all together for us, Marianne. I see the committee has made their way back into the room. So I'll certainly uh, pass the mic back over. All right, thank you, thank Mary. You. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Charlie. And thank you, Marianne. And thank you, Jacob Sherman and Ilya Delio. The committee has deliberated and um, we are very appreciative of this presentation and the doctoral dissertation and we pass the doctoral dissertation. We approve it. Um, many huge and hearty congratulations to Marianne after many years of work on this project, beautiful artworks and beautiful poetry, which did not even come up today, but um, ask Marianne about that sometime. And we all in the committee discussion, we all agreed that this is a very generative work. We, we think that it raises many questions and opens many doors, as Marianne mentioned that the two protagonists uh, did in their own time. And so we're really looking forward to seeing further iterations and advancements of this work over the next many years. So big congratulations, Dr. Casanova. Oh, my. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Wow. This is the moment. <laughs> the moment. You get to learn the secret handshake next time you're in North America. <laughs> okay. Okay. I suppose that's worth going to America for. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, committee, for your your support and your uh, your guidance over the, the the writing time, the drafting and redrafting time. And I appreciate your, your questions and your, your input across the process. And I appreciate the presence of everyone who's online too. There's some, uh, some very uh, good friends and, uh, and people who've been a part of my life for a long time up there. So uh, great, thank you very much. Wow, doctor, mm -hmm. oh my. <laughs> <laughs> Really wonderful work, wonderful work. So I think it's morning and you have the whole day over there to enjoy yes. this elation, right? Something like that, yes. Um, Pauline has to go to a, a Christmas function. So, yes. uh, so she's she's going to excuse herself. She's been waiting for, for the, 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 verdict. <laughs> the verdict, yes. <laughs> so, thank you, Pauline. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. Great. Committee members, did you have any um, last words that you wanted to share with Marianne before we close out? Just congratulations, Marianne. It's a it's a really uh, a provocative work, and you have a lot here to build on for the future. So congratulations, and go forth. You know, help this world become a better planet and a better world for a new God. <laughs> Thank you, Ilya. I'll try and follow follow your example. <laughs> oh. Yeah, just a heartfelt congratulations, Marianne. This is a tremendous, uh, a tremendous achievement and uh, as an, an, an integral achievement. We didn't talk, as Elizabeth mentioned, nearly as much about your process and the way you integrated your creativity and your the, the creation of these expressive artifacts. 
not just as a side note, but as a part of your interpretive uh, process, a part of your intellectual understanding of these figures. Yeah. I think that was really fascinating. And there's just a lot of promise in what you've done here. So I'm eager to see where, how you continue to let it emerge and be and act in the world. So congratulations, Dr. Casanova. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. All right. Well, big thanks to the committee members. And um, do please uh, return the dissertation assessment form um, if you haven't done so yet. We have to file that together with um, the dissertation and the signature paperwork. We may be in touch about signatures and processes. Yeah. I think Charlie will help me uh, wrap that all up. Um, so thank you. Um, friends and colleagues far and wide who have attended today to learn and support Marianne. Thank you, Charlie, for all the technical help and logistics. And most of all, thank you to Dr. Marianne Casanova for your wonderful <laughs> work um, that is so inspiring to all of us. And I wish you, you. a wonderful day. Thank you very much. It will be a wonderful day. Yes. Indeed. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. Okay.